So hello, my name is Jody Scholes. I am your instructor for the MBLEX review course. Uh, and today uh, we have a wonderful amount of information to a little bit more detail today. Um, this is an MBLEX review, uh, but there are a few things that I realized we hadn't been reviewing. So the order of class today is we're gonna talk a little bit about the test. We have, um, our class goes in three parts. Uh, so first we talk about the test because one of the differences in this course is that I teach you how to take the test. That is as important as what is on the test. So we're gonna go over some strategies about the MBLEX, some understanding about the MBLEX. Then we'll move into our learning part of the class and that's the majority of class. Uh, today we're gonna to be going over some random topics, but uh, the skeletal system and we're gonna cover the joints because we haven't talked about the six different types of um, synovial fluid joints. Uh, so we're gonna talk about those. Um, and then we're gonna do see a video on the pathway of blood through the heart. And it's really fun. Uh, I'll post the video as well independently in the, on the patron site. Um, and then uh, to close today, uh, we normally will dissect questions. I don't have questions prepared for you because I wanted to take a few minutes when it felt appropriate to go ahead and talk about the patron site, how the online work learning tool works, how the online learning center works, because I realized that I don't have any, I haven't shared that with you. And so um, I wanna uh, go ahead and, and just be clear about that. So, um, so yeah, so welcome. Uh, so let's start off um, with a few facts about, um, about last week or about the last two weeks actually. And that is that we had two people, two people passed the MBLEX, yay. Um, Melissa passed the MBLEX, congratulations. And Natalie passed the MBLEX, I just found out today, yay. So as much as we celebrate that, we had two of our graduates in our class that did not pass, that took it and did not pass. Um, and so, and that is part of the journey. I share the celebration with you, but I also share those points of failing forward um, because it's important to know your, your, for me, it's important that you know, it's a bumpy ride. And it, you know, it just may not be like you thought it was gonna be. I mean, and that's okay. We learn by going through our process. And so um, we learn by feeling for others, feeling happy for others and feeling like, oh, okay, what did they not do, right? And I wanna kind of drum up some of that, um, that nervousness, you know? Um, that, um, that discomfort, because once you feel nervous, once you feel that, uh, that anxiety, it gets a lot easier to deal with. We recognize it when it comes up and there is going to be anxiety. There is going to be nerve. There are going to be nerves when you take this test. And last, in our last class, we talked about controlling what you can control and letting the rest, just letting the rest be. And if you've had an experience of failing forward, bravo, man, you're still here. It, I mean, almost everybody, almost everybody in class has failed the MBLEX at least once. And I am so impressed and um, by the continued effort to, um, if you've taken it twice or three times or, or nine times, we have a student who's taken this test nine times um, and because it's not an easy test. And you know what, At, when you're called to be a massage therapist, sometimes you're not a book person. Look, I'm not really a detail person. I'm more of a big picture person. And so I'm like, eh, Nodes of the kidney, meh, who cares? Yeah, but, you know, of course you care if you have type two diabetes or, you know, you've got, you know, something, you've got dialysis. Um, but in your practice of massage therapist, when you are a licensed massage therapist, 
it depends what you choose to focus on. I mean, you are going to do your first 100 sessions and just get them out of the way. Just get your hands on bodies. In fact, I would encourage you now, if you're um, listening after class or you're, you're hearing class today, go ahead and get your hands on bodies. Keep that touch skill set strong. Because if you're here, if you're listening to this, if you're participating, this is way bigger than just a job. This is a calling. And so it actually doesn't matter how long it takes you to pass. You just, it, it, this is just one of the hurdles we go over. But in the meantime, keep your hands on people. And if you're most comfortable with friends and family, that's great. If you want to extend that circle and um, we're not charging for massage, but we can ask for a donation um, just to keep your hands on people. Yeah, and maybe there's a special population that you want to support. Maybe it's you know firemen, maybe it's nurses, maybe it's the teachers of special needs students. There's many creative ways you can keep your hands on people um, because you've been through school. You are, you know what you're doing. And I just want you to keep your, your skills sharp. Speaking specifically to the Amblex um, and controlling what we can control. Remember, you can control showing up early, getting a good night's sleep, having a positive mindset, facing the little monkey mind that is there, right? <laughs> Tell that monkey mind, thank you for sharing. And now shush, shush. We are going to stay intentionally in a positive mindset. And is it, you know, um, faking it? Sometimes, but there's some truth in the fake it till you make it. And I'm not saying not, not to be who you truly are, but I'm also encouraging you to recognize if you get into a little rut. If you get into a rut, that's okay, it's normal. It's a part of stretching. You're doing something you've never done before. You're passing this test. You're becoming a licensed massage therapist. You're stretching. And so that's normal to be a little nervous and whatever comes up. Just know it's gonna come up, recognize it. Say to that part of yourself, thank you for sharing. I mean, there are times that it's my family members who really mean well, they really do. But sometimes they just, they have a way of kind of working it in, working in a comment and boy, that can be, it can replay in my head. And so I invite you to just recognize if there has been something that's been a negative influence, a worry, anxiety, nervousness that you're just trying to ignore, bring it to the front and be like, yeah, I'm a little worried. Yeah, I'm a little nervous. Yeah, okay, cool. Now what? Isn't it, you know, it, it, in one class I, I uh, took, uh, I was told to say, isn't that curious when we have something going on? Isn't that curious? And that's okay. We can be curious about it. Once we feel the anxiety, we feel the disappointment, we feel the, the, the nervousness, just know that that's actually a good sign. That means you're taking this seriously. Yeah, you're doing what you need to do to stretch, to grow, to get out of your comfort zone. No growth happens in that comfort zone, right? In that rut, sometimes, you know, people get into a rut and then they furnish it. They stay right there. No, not you guys, not you. You're showing up, you're doing the work, you're stretching, you're growing. 
and just know that that nervous energy, that anxiety, even the disappointment is all okay. It's all normal. Even when you've got other degrees, we have students who go through this class who have degrees in other things and still have trouble passing this test. It's because this is about learning to take the test as well as learning the material, as well as learning to observe ourselves, Because this is also a very important part of how you approach your treatment room. When we approach that treatment room door, we get to take everything that's happened for us, to us in the day and to put it aside. It's a very important part of being an effective massage therapist is to leave our stuff at the door. And you know, you, I mean, you've been practicing, you've, you've done clinics, you've been in practice. We leave our stuff at the door, but that takes a certain amount of self-awareness. And so this is also what we bring to the MBLEX, a certain amount of self-awareness. We're gonna do the work, we're gonna learn the material. In fact, we're about to jump right in and talk about the skeletal system. Um, and yet we also have this intangible part of passing the test. And that is maintaining a positive mindset, failing forward if that's part of your experience and, and just knowing that it's a perfect journey. It really is with all the bumps, with all the delays, with all the paperwork, with all the traffic, whatever has happened, that it's actually a perfect journey because it's yours. All right, let's get started with our content. Um, so I, let's see, there we go. I just got a little bubble that my internet connection is a little unstable. So just wave at me or put something in the chat uh, if that becomes a challenge. Let's see. Yay. All right, Shereen, good to see you. Good to see, in fact, good to see each of you. Lynn, Sandy, Shereen, Betsy, Annabelle, Jessica, I forget, oh, is it Natasha? Who's that Trey's iPad? <laughs> we got a whole houseful today. Uh, so Ms. Jones, yeah, did I say Betsy? All right, good to see you. All right, let's go ahead and Namika, that's right, hey, okay. All right, let's pop this out and we'll get started. And are we on the speaker view? I believe so. Oh, thank you for bearing with me with this technology stuff, let me, I'll be right back to the technology. I just want to make sure we're on the right view. There we go. Okay. <laughs> oh, Lord. Okay. So, beautiful. So we're going to be talking about the skeletal system today, and we're going to focus on the uh, types of joints, but I wanted to just do a general overview of the skeletal system uh, and the benefits of massage for the skeletal system. Um, so that you know, um, I do offer tutoring one-on-one. -on -one. This course uh, is really meant to be a review. So we're not diving deep into like skeletal bone composition or the makeup of skeletal muscles or things like that. We're going to be going over a general overview. We get pretty detailed, um, but it's not as detailed as you got in massage school. Um, because I've got an hour with you and I want to just kind of bring forward in your memory uh, what um, what you learned or what you have to learn. So, because some schools are different than others <laughs> and some people haven't been in school for like 20 years like me. Um, so anyhow, there are 206 bones in the body, in the human body. Uh, and we only need to know um, a little, about a hundred of those bones. We don't need to know all the names of all the bones in the hands and the feet. We just need to know where those are located. Um, and so uh, there's, there are many, many bones in our hands and feet. In fact, over half of the bones in our body are in our hands and feet. But the long bones that we, the 
the major bones we want to know are right here in this image. And uh, these are the anatomical names for those bones. So we've got the clavicle, we've got the humerus, we've got the radius and the ulna, we've got the carpals in our wrist, the metacarpals are in our hands, carpals, metacarpals, carpals in the wrist, metacarpals in the hand, and then phalanges. I want to just point out that you've got metatarsals in your feet. So metacarpals in the hand, carpal bones are in the wrist, right? Carpal tunnel syndrome, carpals in the hand. Let's move across the body here that you're seeing. And you'll see, um, well, you'll see the anterior part of the scapula, also called the shoulder blade. We've got the ribs or the costals. In between these ribs are what we have as our intercostal muscles, our breathing muscles, right? The ones that expand and contract that help us breathe, our diaphragm that elevates and depresses to help us breathe. And looking at these bones, uh, we have uh, we've talked about the clavicle, the mandible, the cranium, the skull. Uh, let's see, obviously the spine. So the Axial skeleton being the highlighted part here. You see the cranium, the skull, and the vertebrae. That's the axial skeleton, including the rib cage. And the appendicular skeleton. Actually, all of these extremities are the appendicular. So we have the pelvis, also called the ilium. So the pelvic bones, remember here right in the front, we've got a bony landmark, the ASIS, ASIS, the anterior superior iliac crest, anterior superior iliac crest right here. In the vertebral column, we've talked about breakfast, lunch, and dinner, as far as a way to remember the number of vertebrae in your, uh, in your spine. The cervical vertebrae have seven here in the neck. The thoracic are the 12 vertebrae. So breakfast, lunch, and dinner, breakfast at seven, lunch at noon, dinner at five. And to wind up, we have five lumbar vertebrae. Breakfast, cervical, lunch, thoracic, lumbar dinner, seven, 12, and five. Underneath the lumbar is the sacrum, and that is the triangular bone. Doesn't really show a very good picture of it here. I think we get a better one in a minute. Um, but the sacrum and the coccyx. So the sacrum is the triangular bone at the base of the skull, the base of the skull, base of the spine, and then the coccyx is that nice little tiny tailbone right at the bottom. Let's review our femur is the long bone of the leg. Rectus femoris, femur. Rectus femoris is one of our quadriceps. The patella, kneecap. We've got the tibia and the fibula here on the bottom. And we have our tarsals and our metatarsals. Tarsals in the foot, metatarsals, tarsals in the ankle, metatarsals in the foot, and the phalanges. Phalanges apply to either fingers or to toes, they're the same name. But metacarpals versus metatarsals. And for me, tarsal, for some reason, sounds like a talon, like an eagle's talon. I don't know why if you, that sounds the same to you or not, but the talons are the tarsals and those are our feet. All right. Oh, yay. All right. So cervical, you can see our skull, the cranium, cervical vertebrae, our scapula. You can see a nice picture of the scapula now. The posterior ribs. Most people have two floating ribs. We move down the thoracic. So each of the thoracic vertebrae, the 12, 
have ribs normally on most humans. Some people have extra ribs, some people have, they're missing a rib. You can see here, this sacrum is actually a triangle, coccyx, posterior view of the pelvis. So the axial skeleton is what we saw. Now we see highlighted the appendicular skeleton in the, in the color, the a little bit of a shade there. We didn't talk about the talus, which is another bone of the foot, and the calcaneus, which is actually your heel. So as you can see, we saw in the earlier picture, the axial skeleton is highlighted. And in this picture, the appendicular skeleton is highlighted. So we're gonna talk about joints. Hmm. Yay. These are the different types of joints. And in the online learning center, there is a more in-depth look at these joints um, but I'm gonna go pretty I'm gonna go pretty detailed today um, and so there are six types of joints that you'll want to be aware of and I so wish that this test would just talk about the joints that were easy <laughs> because I think um, so we have six let's just review the names the ball and socket joint the ellipsoid or ellipsoidal joint, it's also sometimes called a planar joint, the hinge joint, the saddle joint, a gliding joint, and then a pivot joint. And so of these, we're going to look at the directions and the placement of these. So the ball and socket and the hinge are probably the easiest, right? So you've got the ball, you've got a socket. So you've got the ball, which is at the top of the bone. You've got the socket. Now, most commonly we think of either the hip or the shoulder. Very different joints, right, in their makeup, but they're both a ball and socket joint. So the shoulder is very open because it sits in here in the, with the acromion process, you're seeing here this lovely um, manubrium. You don't need to know these names. It's just the, the technical terms. This is right here, but frozen shoulder syndrome, a pathology called frozen shoulder syndrome is because this area of the ball and socket joint in a shoulder gets stuck. And so there are specific techniques for that, which you can learn in your continuing ed. But the shoulder joint is a ball and socket joint, even though it's really open. It's way more open than what you see with the hip, right? The hip is a, a very closed joint. Also an easy one to remember is the hinge joint because we use hinges in our house for everything, right? We open a, a cupboard door, it's on a hinge. We've heard that word before. Our elbow joint is a hinge joint. Our knee joint is a hinge joint. It moves in one, in one plane. Then we get into some of these other weird ones but we do need to know them. So the ellipsoidal joint or the ellipsoid joint. This is a joint that moves in two directions. It's, um, it's our wrist, basically. I think we have some in our ankle too, we'll get there. Um, but the ellipsoidal joint uh, is basically the wrist and it's, I believe I have one more picture of this. Nope. All right, so it allows us to move left and right up and down. It's, I'm, I'm resisting saying a gliding joint because that's a different type of it. But the ellipsoidal joint, it's shaped like this circle, this kind of elongated circle. And we find it uh, specifically in our wrist. Moving along, we've got three other joints to cover. The saddle joint. Good to know, I mean, that that is in our thumb. And you see how it actually works. So it, we are the, you know, the thumb is really important to our hand. And this is a lovely place to massage, by the way, right in here in that saddle joint. Um, so it, you know, it does a lot of work, that opposing grip. And it um, gives us a lot of control, but that's where we find it is right there in the thumb, a saddle joint. 
So the gliding joint, all right. That allows us to do kind of this movement. You'll see the hand, the picture of the hand. It's also though that is what is um, in our um, in our ankles as well. Um, it's they're they're in a number of different places, but just know that the direction of the uh, gliding joints allows us to move our hand um, left and right. So like the queen's wave a little bit. And so here are uh, the places that these joints occur in the body. I believe those are the final slides I have that are specific. Uh, so the pivot joint, which we haven't talked about yet, have not talked about yet, um, is between C1 and C2. So cervical vertebrae one, cervical vertebrae two. And what direction do you think a pivot joint? Take a look at that little arrow right here, up here. So the pivot joint allows our head, our cranium, to move left and right. So we can take it over. This is our pivot joint between C1 and C2. So hinge joints are found in the elbow and also the knee. Saddle joint, uh, right here in the thumb. We point out the ball and socket. That's it both in the hip and the shoulder. A condyloid joint is not a, it's, that's also another name for an ellipsoidal joint. So condyloid, I don't know if you can see that, C-O-N-D-Y-L-O-I-D, that's another name for the ellipsoidal joint, a condyloid joint. And this is in the wrist. And then we've got that plane joint or that gliding joint. And that's found in, uh, so it's a gliding joint or a planar joint. And it's two, so you see the diagram here, it slides or glides in its movement. Got one more uh, full body uh, slide to show you here. So again, just by the synovial fluid joints, pivot joints in the neck. Gliding joints also occur between the vertebrae. Hinge joints, very straightforward knees and elbows, ball and sockets here at the shoulder, a condyloid or ellipsoidal, there's another way you can see condyloid or ellipsoidal joint, and then our saddle joint. And for those of you who like colors, <laughs> one more look. <laughs> this is the atlas and the axis, um, and I'm happy to uh, post this slide for you um, as well. This is a lovely little um, teaching tool. So the atlas and the axis is the pivot joint, right? So um, there's, it, it sits like on the top of, well, C1, C2, and it allows the skull to move back and forth. So the atlas and the axis, that is um, C1 and C2. As another name for them is the atlas and the axis. And that is, uh, considered in that those two vertebrae, that's um, technically a condyloid joint, but there's a pivot joint there as well. So pivot joint, yes. It is a pivot joint, not a condyloid. Take that out. Pivot joint only on the atlas and axis. I was thinking lower down on, this, on the uh, vertebrae. All right, so you see the, in the red is the shoulder joint, is the pivot, is the um, ball and socket joints. In the blue, we've got the hinge joints. And you can see uh, the different, uh, the saddle joint is in the base of the thumb. Let's see if I covered all of these joints for you. So the radial ulnar joint is technically a condyloid joint. Um, and that is one of those uh, um, ellipsoidal joints. So remember, so find your radius and ulna. Right, it's in the right at your elbow, basically right in here. And if you turn your hand, you'll feel the radius gliding. The radius actually rolls and it moves along an edge of the tibia. So the radius is what is moving. The, the, 
the ulna stays um, the ulna stays right there stable, but the radius rolls, and that rolling is actually an ellipsoidal or a condyloid joint. So you've got joints in between the um, the fingers as well. We've got uh, joints in between the uh, the feet, lots of them. But when we look at the joints of the hands and the feet, uh, that is bone, is joints are bones that are meeting. What type of biological material, <laughs> what, what connects bones to bones compared to muscles to bones? You can go ahead and just put it right there in the chat. Tell me, tell me. Right, yes, ligaments, yes, thank you very much, very good. Uh, I'm seeing a question here, I thought, yes, Sandy, yes. Namika, yes. All right, gliding joints were the metatarsals and the metacarpals. So, um, yes, so they're green, they're gliding, you're correct. Did I say that differently? I might have said that differently. Um, you know, like I said, I'm not a huge detail girl. I know a good pivot, a, a good hinge joint. I know a good ball and socket. Um, but these other, these other, I know the saddle joint. Um, but these other ones, you know, whether it's gliding or ellipsoidal, you know, I'm a little, little fuzzy on those. But in the feet, they are gliding. You can see here they're green and gliding. All right. Any other questions in there? Yes, ligaments. So yes, ligaments attach bones to bones and what attaches muscles to the bones? Very good. Yes, I'm seeing those answers. Come on in, tendon, tendon, tendon. Yes, ma'am. Um, and what about the different planes of movement? Hmm. Uh, well, I can, I'm happy to talk about the different planes of movement. Um, did you have a more specific question or uh, like what planes of movement these joints move in? I didn't talk about the planes of movement. I've got a lot of slides on that. Let's see. Oops, I stopped the share. My apologies. Thanks again for your patience with my technology. <laughs> So let me go to all right here and stop that. Ah. Okay. I think I need a list. Okay. So we'll cover some of those planes of movement um, just so that you can be familiar with those. It is covered in the online learning center, which we'll talk about in about three or four minutes. Where's all my windows? So this may just as a reminder, uh, here are your planes of movement. Make that a little bigger for you. So we've got our sagittal plane. The sagittal plane to me also sounds like a saddle, sagittal, saddle. And if you were sitting on a saddle, that's the plane that divides you left and right. The sagittal plane. We also have the frontal plane and that divides you front from back, anterior from posterior. And then we have the transverse plane, which basically goes just below your umbilicus, your belly button, where your umbilical cord was, your umbilicus, and that is top to bottom. Now, it's worth mentioning um, this superior and inferior are directions. And uh, so the clavicle, as you see in the di diagram, is superior to the umbilicus, your belly button. The belly button is inferior to the clavicle. Just right here to the, to the right, you see cranial and caudal. And those two words normally refer, are, are used in animal terms. But cranial is towards the head, caudal towards the tail. 
So when you see that word caudal, know that it's towards the tail, the tail end, or it's inferior, but we don't often use it with, um, with human beings. So cranial, obviously towards the cranium, right? Caudal, towards the tail. Quick review of uh, the, the movements or the descriptions of the planes of movement, anterior and posterior. The sternum is anterior. The spine is posterior. Medial and lateral are always in relation to the midline of the body. Anatomical position, thumbs out, arms forward, facing forward, feet pointing forward, hip width apart. That is anatomical position. And when asked about directions of the body, always put yourself just in anatomical position. Pinkies are in, thumbs are out. This is anatomical position. And therefore superficial and deep. Also, we're talking usually about tissue pressure, superficial or deep. So superficial right on the top, deep. Proximal and distal usually are referring to long bones of the body. Proximal and distal. So in this case, we see an elbow and a wrist. The elbow is proximal to the wrist. The wrist is distal to the elbow. Distance, out, distal, moving out. Proximal, closer to the midline of the body, up, but up. Long bone, distal, the elbow is distal, I'm trying to get you in the shot here. The elbow is distal to the shoulder joint. The shoulder joint is proximal to the elbow. Likewise, we see an example here with the knee. The knee is proximal to the ankle. The ankle is on the distal end of the tibia, the distal end of the fibula. So the tibia and fibula, bones of the lower leg, the distal end of the tibia. No idea why we have a pectoralis major muscle here, other than to maybe say this is proximal. And you know, again, planes of movement of the body, um, but this kind of gets into a little bit more of um, the movements of the body versus the joints. Uh, you will see that the shoulder, because it's still a ball and socket joint, but it can circumduct. And the movement of circumduction, a big cone. So if, uh, if we had an ice cream cone, the pointy end of the cone would be here. Circumduction is a big round circle. Circumduction. Latin, can we circumduct our hip? In theory, we can because it's 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 just not that wide open. Really, hip movement is usually flexion and extension. So even though again that ball and socket joint, we'll see flexion and extension in just a moment. Let's take a look at this though lateral flexion of the neck. That's the ear towards the shoulder. The ear towards the shoulder. Lateral flexion of the neck. Which plane is that movement in? If I'm laterally flexing my neck and we're picking between sagittal, frontal, or transverse, lateral flexion of the neck happens in, so this is ear to the shoulder, lateral flexion of the neck. We can also do lateral flexion of the trunk, right? So if you're grounded in your seat, you're laterally flexing your trunk. Let me see your answers. It's actually going to be in the in the frontal plane because remember front front to back, transverse is upper to lower, sagittal is left to right. So we're this movement is actually occurring in our frontal plane. Excuse me, yes, our frontal plane. 
quick review of just a couple other terms, elevation and depression. We elevate our scapulas, we depress our jaw or our mandible. Supination and pronation. Supination is when we move into holding the bowl of soup. Supination, if you're in supine position on the massage table, you face up or face down? Supine position. Yes. Bring it in, bring it in, bring it in. So one way to remember supine position, <clears throat> we can hold a bowl of soup. Supine, holding a bowl of soup. Yes, thank you. Face up, face up, face up. Yes, good. Um, and so holding that bowl of soup. So supination, the movement of supination is you can hold that bowl of soup. Pronation pours the soup out. Pours the soup out. Supination of the forearm ends with you could hold the bowl of soup. Pronation, you pour it out. And, you know, we've covered these in the past, but I think it's lovely to just touch base on them. Extension and flex, extension of the fingers, flexion of the fingers. We always love the abduction and adduction, right? Uh, so when we add to the midline of the body, we bring our, our feet in. So if we're out here, we're standing in anatomical position, adducting is bringing the feet in, abducting out. Abduction out. So we're moving away from the midline of the body. And we've got some medial rotation of the shoulder here demonstrated. So if you had your elbows stuck to your side, you're bringing that movement in. So elbow stuck to your side, bringing that in. Medial, medial, moving towards the midline of the body, right? Medial. So the head of the humerus is medially rotating, medial rotation of the shoulder. Likewise, lateral rotation of the shoulder, elbow in, the head of the humerus is rotating laterally, it's rotating out. And we have rotation at the neck and we have rotation of the spine. The hips stay put. Rotation of the spine, rotation at the pivot joint in the neck. All right, you blowing your hair back yet? <laughs> Yeehaw, nice review, huh? Yeah. So that is our review of the joints and the skeletal system. There's so much more to navigating the body. Um, and uh, I wanted to introduce you now in this last section of class um, to how the Online World Learning Center works. And then also um, the other thing was tutoring. Oh yes, okay. Uh, so uh, the Online Learning Center is an adjunct, uh, is, an, um, is more, uh, than just these lessons. So I've prepared longer versions of these lessons. Um, and actually over the next 14 weeks, we'll be updating every class. Yeah, um, so it's been fun to start working on that. Uh, but right now we've got great learning in the online learning center. And it is a total of seven different classes that represent uh, the different categories of the MBLEX. Um, and so, uh, we have seen before, let's go ahead and just take a quick, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you for your patience. We're gonna take a quick look at the um, FSMTV content outline, which I have for you. Yeah. I just wanted to pull it up so that we don't. So in your, uh, when we, uh, go to the Federation of State Massage Therapy Boards um, website. There is an FSMTB content outline. This tells you exactly what is tested. There's no more history. There's no more oriental body work. This 
document tells you exactly what is on to study for. Now, I, I often say, don't bother. Um, let me go ahead and make this a little bigger. There we go. Uh, don't bother with the uh, origins, insertions, or actions of the muscles. Um, those are going to be super hard questions. Um, but the classes in the online learning center reflect this. We have anatomy and physiology, upper and lower body. Um, in that is some kinesiology because we go over the movement of those muscles in the A&P classes, upper and lower. We've got a pathology class. Uh, we have a benefit um, of massage uh, class. Likewise, we have a client assessment class. We've got two uh, ethics uh, classes and, and guidelines to a professional practice. So we've got ethics, boundaries, laws and regulations, and a class on guidelines to a professional practice. Those are all in uh, the online learning center. Uh, they have their own subject matter specific quizzes. So as you move through those uh, classes, um, you also get to take a subject matter specific quiz on what you've been tested on. Now, as you move through, I, I load those up on Mondays. So I take a peek at what you've done through the last week. And some have a little, you know, have, some take a little vacation from the online learning center. That's fine. In fact, you don't need to use the online learning center at all. We cover a lot of that material right here in the live classes, but some of you are very good students and uh, you're very like, you know, like you just wanna get in there and do as much as you can to get ready. Um, and that's where the online learning, cause I can't cover the depth of material in this class that I can just in a lecture that you can watch. Um, so there are those classes. Those classes are available for any patron that does $5 or more per month. And the only reason I, I do that is because it actually costs me money each month to host that and to deliver those classes. Uh, so it's on a very nice online platform uh, and uh, the digital, it's called Digital Chalk, um, but it allows me to also house the practice exam. So in the online learning center, you've got the classes with the subject matter specific quizzes, but then there's a practice exam. And it's about 1,600 questions now. And that means you'll get a fresh practice exam. It's never the same test twice. And so you can take as many of those as you want. And also, uh, if and when you pass, or even if you don't pass, um, oh, one important thing about the practice exam, it has a timer. You do actually have to finish that within four hours. You can't leave it and come back to it the next day. It actually has to be finished. Otherwise, it times you out. And then I have to go in and manually reset it, blah, 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 quack, quack. Um, so just when you sit down to take the test, the idea is that you are going to build your test taking stamina by taking these longer tests. When do we ever take a two hour test? Usually not unless you're still in school, right? I mean, how many of you guys can read, put it in the chat if you read for two hours at a stop. Can you sit down and read? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I would say, or a, a question just came up in the chat, says I, all I have is my phone. This is, you can't practice on your phone. Sorry, you can't take a practice test on your phone. You can, but the it, what we were trying to do here is to simulate your test taking experience at uh, Pearson View Testing Center. So everybody goes to Pearson View to take the test. You sit down at a laptop. So if you don't have access to a laptop, what I would encourage you to do is actually go find a local university, go find a local library um, and schedule some time on one of their devices. I mean, today I'm at the local university. I'm at uh, Florida Gulf Coast University. Got a whole bunch of students out here. <laughs> but I'm camping on their uh, their Wi-Fi because my Wi-Fi at home was a little sketchy and I wanted to make sure. So sometimes you got to go out. Sometimes you just got to go. Like, I love going to the library. I'm a little weird like that. I love the library. I mean, I love their study rooms. I have a library card in like four states because every time I go someplace, I love going to the library. They're there to study. It's a great vibe. You have no distractions. And I know some of you, 
I, I know you now. Like start a practice exam. And then all of a sudden it becomes so important to go clean under your fridge. It's like, all of a sudden it's like, oh, wait, I could, I can go um, start some bread. I've been wanting to use my sourdough, you know, starter. Like this is time to study. This is what your brain does to kind of get you out. Oh, good. I'm glad you went to the library last week. Yay. This also, when you leave your home to study, this tells your friends and family that you're serious. You're serious about this. So the online learning center is really best experienced from a laptop. Certainly you can use a tablet, but it's not any fun on the phone. I mean, it's a lot. It's a little tiny screen, right? A little tiny screen. So don't do that. That doesn't simulate your test taking experience. So I strongly encourage you to, to do it on a laptop, just like you're going to be doing for your actual test. Yeah. Um, so that's how the Online Learning Center works, available for patrons of $5 or more a month. Um, and yeah, it costs me money to do that. But also, we're here in this community because, because we believe in each other. We're all on this path together. I have been a licensed massage therapist for 26 years. And I love this profession. It is, it changes so many different, so many lives. I mean, I'm writing a book right now about my experience. It actually, technically it's about the body blueprint and the metaphysical meaning of pain. But what we learn, what we facilitate, that safe space, that sacred space that you facilitate on your massage table is so important. I, I have a feeling it's actually promoting peace in the world. I think massage therapy makes the world a better place. In fact, I know you practicing in your zip code, your zip code is a nicer place to live because you give people massages there. The people who you massage are nicer human beings after they are off your table. Seriously, the ripple effect is, think about the ripple effect. Somebody gets a massage on your table, then they leave. Maybe they're nicer to their spouse. Maybe they're not as angry. They don't lay on the horn in traffic. They're just in a better space. They're, they're vibrating at a better frequency after they, I don't want to get too woo-woo on you, but I'm just saying that this is the reason I do what I do, that I teach and I, I basically <laughs> in the past, I've said, drag you by the ponytail uh, over through to, uh, to being a licensed massage therapist is because I know the work is so important. I know the work you're called to do is so important. And so I'm your biggest fan. I'm your cheerleader. I'm your instructor. But I'm also here to remind you that this is who you're meant to be. You might be a bunch of other stuff. You might be a wife and a mother, a spouse, a partner. You might have a full-time job. That's all good. I'm happy for you. I, I think that's great. And yet not everybody is called to be a massage therapist. I like to remind you guys of this. Not everybody is willing to deal with armpits. Not everyone is willing to deal with feet. Not everyone is going to drape appropriately to hide the gluteal cleft. The ass crack. Not everyone's going to deal with that. Not everyone is going to be called you know, to be in a room where a client might fart or stink or have not shaved legs. I know that's not really very pretty, not a nice picture to paint for massage therapy, but I'm just telling you, normally I meet therapists and they're like, oh yeah, I'm, yeah, that's that. It's normal. I mean, I love feet. I mean, 
I remember a, a client of mine, um, a young man, you know, probably in his 30s, having his first massage ever. And I'm giving his, his first massage ever. And I, you know, go to the end of the legs and I start working on the feet and literally picks his head up and he says to me, you're going to work on my feet? I was like, yeah, if that's okay. He's like, okay. And it was such a new experience for him. And he left, he looked at me right in the eyes and said, you know, that was good. And I'm like, yeah, it was, right? He goes, I would do that again. This is the safe, wonderful space that you get to facilitate for people. And so that's why I'm so enthusiastic and so committed to being with you on this part of your path to getting licensed. So kind of went off on a rabbit trail there, but back to that's how the online learning center works. Um, I am available for one-to-one -one tutoring. My, have you ever gone to a hotel and you booked it online and maybe you paid 60, 70, 80 bucks for it. Um, but on the back of the door, it says, this room is, you know, $200 a night. And you're like, that's not what I paid. Well, the rate on the back of the door is called the rack rate for the room. It's the promoted rate. Like if you just logged on to the regular website and paid full price for a hotel room, which hopefully, you know, um, you've found ways around that. My rack rate for, uh, so my full rate for tutoring is 125 for an hour, but many of you guys aren't working right now. And so what I tell you is make me an offer. If you want to spend some time one-on-one, -on -one, just make me an offer. Look, I am very enthusiastic about your success. And so we'll figure out a way to make it work. I do 125 for the hour and then um, three hours for 300. Um, if you want to just put something in place and we can do half hour sessions, we can do one hour sessions. Um, but even if we go over an hour, your, um, your time is your session is your session. You know, so um, I ask that when we do set up an hour that you leave about an hour and 15 minutes uh, to an hour and a half for us to be together. I, I dragged Jessica through a two hour review of a practice exam uh, a couple of weeks ago. And so she hung in there with me, <laughs> but it's about building your stamina, right? Yeah, so you can take a practice exam. Some of the stuff we do in the tutoring is we take a practice exam and review it. We review the ones that were incorrect, the questions that were incorrect um, and uh, get specific about what didn't make sense. We dissect questions. Uh, sometimes we cover content, um, you know, if, if, if certain areas. Uh, we had a practice session on pathology, on medications uh, recently, because there are going to be some medications on, on your exam. Um, so in any case, uh, for the benefit of all of those listening, not live in class, I'm going to go ahead and end the recording and say thank you very much. Those, for those of you who are here live in class, uh, then uh, we'll continue our conversation. Uh, but you can join this group uh, as a part of live classes when you become a patron, uh, patron backslash Jody Skulls. I'll put the link in the chat uh, or in the description. Uh, but my name again is Jody Skulls. I'm your instructor for the MBLEX review course. And thank you so much for listening and good luck.